afternoon, everyone. Uh, and welcome. I'm really thrilled today. Uh, can you hear me? Should I? Yep. Okay, good. Um, so, I'm really excited about today and uh, the naming of this auditorium for our very own Bill Mahichi. So, uh, last year, we were kind of sitting around a bunch of us associate chairs and the then chair, Robert Sellers, and Bill's name came up, as it often does. Um, it's wonderful to have Bill around physically very often. And we said, you know, we need to do something to recognize Bill. So we thought, okay, you know, what do you do to recognize someone who's had an impact of this magnitude on, uh, on a, an institution, an organization? And we came up with all kinds of things. Um, and we thought about what was most important for us to recognize. And we thought, obviously, uh, Bill's contributions to teaching and learning, to the science of, of uh, studying how people teach and how people learn and motivation that has gone on for, uh, for decades here. And the huge impact that he's had locally on the GSIs, uh, the graduate student instructors here, on the faculty, on the staff, on everyone. And we thought, okay, something about teaching. And we thought, where does the teaching happen in East Hall? We thought about this room. So as someone who's taught our big developmental gateway to 300 students sitting in this room, I realized just how many uh, individual students come through here every year. And we thought, that would make sense to name this room after Bill so that students and faculty uh, for uh, eternity will be here <laughs> in the Bill McKeechee Auditorium. Um, we just thought it made sense. So uh, for those of you who don't know, we serve about 5,000 psychology students in this room every single year. So people are constantly rotating through uh, the room. This is also where we teach the classes where we really do a lot of training for our doctoral students. So our gateway courses, these 200 level courses that are introducing students to what we see as the core of psychology, all happens in this room. Not surprisingly, we use Bill's text, Teaching Tips, um, to train our graduate students to help them learn effective ways of teaching. Um, I myself, as an instructor here in this classroom, carried around my dog-eared <laughs> copy of teaching tips. Every, I think we have like four copies in the house between me and my husband um, that were so instrumental to getting started uh, and thinking about how to be an effective instructor, especially in these huge classes that can be really intimidating. Um, Bill has had a huge, uh, huge impact. So we said, yes, let's name uh, 1324 our psychology auditorium after Bill. Seemed pretty straightforward, right? So we said, well, how do you name a room after someone? And it turns out that it's not actually that easy. You can imagine that if you're naming a room that will always be named that, uh, there's a procedure. I not really thought too much about it. And so the procedure was fairly extensive. We had to put together a proposal that talked about why Bill? What was it about Bill that we wanted to really recognize? Um, and so we started thinking about why Bill? And we spent quite a bit of time thinking about um, all kinds of things, from his contributions to the teaching mission of the university, to his contributions as a former chair, um, to his contributions just to the climate of the, of the department, and his generosity that has allowed us to do so many things for our graduate students in terms of faculty recruitment and a range of, of other activities uh, in the department. So we wrote a proposal. I'm just going to read a little bit of the proposal that we wrote. We, so I actually have my name at the top because I was chair at the time, but Rob Sellers, I was associate chair, uh, Fiona Lee, uh, Monique Ward was involved, a range of people were involved in this effort gathering information about Bill, um, which I should say was tremendously gratifying to uh, just to find out all of the amazing things that Bill has done over the years. So we are writing to request that East Hall 1324 be named the Dr. Wilbert Bill McKeechee Auditorium 
in honor of the most well-known researcher, teacher, and administrator in the field of teaching science. And one of the key architects of the University of Michigan Psychology Department. So you might think that could be hyperbole until you really keep reading and realize exactly what Bill's done. Today, the University of Michigan has the largest psychology department in the country and is overwhelmingly acknowledged as the best and most comprehensive department in the world. Much of the credit goes to Dr. Bill Kichi, who chaired the department from 1961 to 1971. During this time, he brought the department to a remarkable size and comprehensiveness, growing the department to over 100 faculty members. At the end of his term as chair, the department was the largest department within the College of LSNA. To achieve this amazing feat, Dr. Mikichi created an intricate set of relationships with research centers, institutes, interdisciplinary programs, and joint programs. For example, essentially we go on to talk about the creation of the combined program in education and psychology, which I've had the pleasure of being a part of. And so if you really think about what's magical about psychology, it's this enduring connection to the research centers across campus and to um, other units. So the number of joint appointments here is pretty astounding. And I think we have Bill really to thank for the, uh, the sort of backbone of that system that makes us so unique. Importantly, Dr. Mikichi is widely regarded as the world's foremost authority on the learning of college students and how to improve it. The learning of college students and how to improve it. He produced pioneering work applying the science of learning to teaching within college classrooms. His research covers a variety of topics ranging from student anxiety in classrooms to how the personality and teaching style of a professor affects learning and still influences teaching practices in higher education today. Beyond his academic publications, and we go on to list the numerous, uh, unbelievable list of, of publications, his book, Teaching Tips, a guidebook for the beginning college teacher, is now in its 12th edition and has been translated into a long list of other languages. Uh, it is widely recognized as one of the preeminent guides for the beginning college teacher. Again, people are just blown away by the fact that Bill is our colleague when I tell him, uh, when I tell them that uh, this, this book started here at Michigan. Dr. McKeechee is the intellectual father of the area of study that's become known as the teaching of psychology, which is the name of a journal and one of the earliest divisions of APA. Without a doubt, Dr. McKeechee is the first person everyone thinks of when we think about college teaching and psychology. Dr. McKeechee's illustrious career is marked by an amazing level of service to the department. So again, he was department chair for 10 years. You can only imagine. Uh, <laughs> and we go on to describe really very uh, important and groundbreaking service. I think the thing that stands out most for me is the developing of the Center for Research and Learning and Teaching, uh, the very first center of that kind. And really, if you go around the country, almost every university in America now has one of these centers for research uh, on teaching. And really, Bill was the pioneer who, uh, who made that happen in, in large part. Dr. McKeechee frequently represented psychology to the broader public. Another hallmark of, of Bill's work has been to uh, really deliver psychology to the public in meaningful ways. Dr. McKeechee's received many awards during his career, uh, some of which he received after his retirement in 1990. So some of the, the biggest ones that stand out uh, were the APA Distinct Award for Distinguished Career Contributions to Education and Training in Psychology, the University of Michigan Distinguished Faculty Governance Award, the Lifetime Contribution Award of the Professional and Organizational Development Network in Higher Education, the APF Gold Medal for Enduring Contributions to Psychology in the Public Interest. The list goes on with these sort of capstone um, awards that represent a lifetime of research excellence. Dr. McKeechee continues to serve the department in several important ways. I was just talking to my honors student a minute ago, and she was uh, talking about Bill inviting her to play cards with him. And then when I told her a little bit about Bill, uh, she was especially, uh, especially impressed. So as we know, and we'll hear a little bit more about later, uh, Bill has developed, along with some graduate students, a card game. Uh, 
talk more about that later, that has been ongoing in East Hall and really contributes considerably to the climate around East Hall. So we end by saying, given Dr. McKeechee's past and future contributions to the department, the university, and the profession, especially his illustrious and pioneering work on effective college teaching, we request, request that East Hall 1324 or East Hall Auditorium be named the Wilbur Bill J. McKeechee Auditorium. Despite all the honors and accolades, 
including those that kept coming at even after his retirement in 1990. I get the sense of ease and fluidity, of movement and grace. The grace of a pitcher, competitive and driven, but also fair, fair-minded and collegial. Though there was a passing reference in the material I was sent of him being absolutely fierce on the mound, got me thinking, especially as a department chair. Uh, and finally, Aristotle, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. In honoring Dr. Bill Mikichi, we celebrate what is best in all of us. Our own efforts towards meeting this high bar of excellence he has set for us, our own desire to inspire a love of learning in our students, a love of teaching in our colleagues, an appreciation for games, and the simple pleasure of camaraderie all now enshrined for us in the Dr. Wilbert Bill J. Mikichi Auditorium. Thank you. Okay, so in thinking about Bill, I wanted to invite one of his friends and colleagues from the CPAP program, and someone who spends a lot of important time with Bill uh, to share some reflections. Kai Cortina. Thank you, Stephanie. So when you happen to be in East Hall at the, in the atrium, uh, psychology atrium, at noon, doing a regular weekday, you might see this picture. There is this man very peaceful. How did I get the next slide? Friendly. Until he talks to you. <laughs> so, what he wants to, you to do is to play with him. He wants you to play murder. So he's just kidding. Come on, join us. Well, what is murder? What is that famous card game? Well, murder is a card game that was invented some 65 years ago for mathematical psychologists here um, at the University of Michigan. And I think, Bill, you are not the first. Pe you were not part of the people who invented it. Yeah, you you just you just inherited it. <laughs> for now, over 50 years at least, Bill McKeechee plays whenever he finds you know people to join him, and it is a lot of fun and. Don't, don't, do not get necessarily murdered. Well, maybe. <laughs> so why would you all, you know, should learn to play murder with him? Well, it's not the game in, in and of itself. No, oh, you don't take away my punchline, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> so why do I encourage undergraduates or psych majors or graduate students particular to really spend an hour of their, their, their precious lunchtime with them playing murder with Bill Mahichi. It's certainly not the game. But along the way, you know, the last 15 years that I played with Bill, is so much you can learn when you play with Bill Mahichi, when you don't take that game very seriously and let yourself killed, you know, more than once, you learn a lot about the history of psychology. And that is probably uh, Bill is a in the unique position of being perhaps the only psychologist still alive who actually has met all those icons of psychology personally. So now I'm interpreting Bill Mikichi, and I have not, you know, talked to him about this, but here's what I think. I think Bill Mikichi is the last person for whom psychology is really still a family, a family of like-minded people who are doing research. If you want to know what problem B. F. Skinner had with playing piano, <laughs> you have to play cards. <laughs> if you want to know about the marital problems of some of the big names, I don't, you know, name them, you know, of big names in psychology, you have to talk to Bill. And I think this is, you know, I, I have to say that I personally find this a little sad. We don't have this anymore. Now psychology has become so large; it's become a big industry. In the different areas of psychology, we rarely speak to each other. And Bill Mikichi was the, perhaps the last person who really knew, knew and still knows the entire discipline across areas, and is a person who is very integrated 
and very welcoming to new ideas, and very open-minded to the very day. And I have to say, you know, every time we get a game together, I'm always looking forward to it, as you know. And we have always, you know, a seat for you. You know, it's a game that's uh, very easy to learn. If you know, if you go from the Midwest and you know how to play euchre, no big deal. In 10 minutes, you can play murder. If you know how to play bridge, you know, dumb yourself a little down because it's not as complicated. But it's similar. The advantage compared to to bridge in particular is you don't need exactly four people. We need three people minimum. But I can go all the way up to seven people or eight people. So come and join us. So, why is the game called murder? Well, I will not tell you. Because in order to you know, learn why it's called murder, you have to come and play with us. Every, every day, weekday, at noon in the psychology atrium, we sometimes don't get a game together, but whenever we can, we, 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 we try. So, if you email Bill or you email me, you know, we will find a day to teach you. And of course, since Bill is such a great teacher, you will have love, you will have fun in the process of learning. He'll still beat you, though. Hmm? He'll still beat you, though. Yeah, yeah, of course, yes. You will get, unfortunately, murdered you know, along the way several times. But as I can, as I can attest to, and Heffer was sitting here, you will survive. Thank you very much. <laughs> and congratulations, Bill, for this honor. You really deserve it. So, Pepper actually said that he lets Bill win sometimes. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, one of the things I've been curious about is how Bill knows everyone's birthday and how you keep track of all the birthdays of every psychologist, I think, ever. Uh, very impressive. So, um, in thinking about how we could celebrate Bill, of course, part of it is his uh, card skills and part of it is his service to the department. But a big part of what makes Bill really important to us is the research that he uh, started that really undergirds all of these efforts. And so we thought maybe we could look into the new generation of people who are studying, learning, and teaching in the classroom. And uh, to do that, we asked two of our very best um, professors in the department, Dr. Shelley Schreier and Bill Gehring, to come and talk with us. So Shelley's going to start out. So Shelley is the Neil M. Coulter Collegiate Lecturer, and she is going to be presenting some of the work that, uh, or, or they are going to be presenting some of their work. I am so delighted to be standing here at the dedication of the Professor Wilbur Bill J. Picicci Auditorium. In 1981, I was a student in Professor McKeechee's Psychology of Aging course here at the University of Michigan. It is now my privilege to be teaching in this classroom named in honor of Professor McKeechee, who I am also honored to respectfully call Bill. To prepare for this brief introduction, I actually went back to get my old college papers, which I still have stored in my basement. Um, I actually found the interview I conducted for my Psychology of Aging course. I had to interview someone who was old. I was a little surprised to find out the person I interviewed was younger than I am now. <laughs> it's funny how our perceptions of age change as we get older, a concept I actually learned in Professor McKeechee's course. However, the lessons learned from Professor McKeechee transcend the content of a class that I took from him. In fact, the most compelling lessons that he gave us are not from the individual classes that he taught, or even the numerous PhD students who he supervised and mentored. But instead, it's the profound lessons he's provided for legions of teachers and educators at colleges and universities throughout the world as the preeminent researcher an educator on how to be an effective teacher. Having served as a teaching assistant during my graduate school days, before we were elevated to the new title of graduate student instructor, and as one of the co-coordinators now of the newly developed teaching academy, the first thing I made sure I did 
Let's get us copies of what I think is the 14th edition now of Teaching Tips by Professor Nikichi, which we make sure we provide to all of our psychology graduate student instructors in the department. From preparing a syllabus to assigning the final grade, providing a template for the process of developing one's own unique style as a college and university instructor, the sensitivity and the pragmatic ways this book was crafted the text lays the foundation for the amazing journey we all take as educators. Like Piaget, Professor Makichi looks not only at what we do as teachers in terms of coming to learn, think, feel, believe, and do, but he also encourages us and reassures us that we will learn from the inevitable mistakes that we will make and the challenges we will all confront. He reminds us that what we need to constantly revise, review, and reflect on our practices, our goals, and even our expectations. Professor Nikichi models the respect for teaching as both a science and an art, breaking it down to its most basic elements, as well as realizing the best learning outcomes may reflect more than the sum of the parts. One of the most important aspects of teaching tips is in its tenor reflecting the pleasures inherent in teaching and the profound influence a teacher can have both in and out of the classroom setting. Professor Nikichi and his co-authors emphasize the respect for the partnership that exists between a teacher and his or her students. He talks about the importance of stressing that to establish an effective learning environment, educators need to not only learn how to teach, but also to explore how our students learn. Teaching Tips states this, quote, it is an interaction of good instructional practices with students, tactical use of learning strategies and skills, motivational processes and self-regulation that results in positive learning outcomes. <coughs> Professor Akichi and his co-authors challenge teachers to support our students to become more strategic and self-regulated learners. His research on teaching is predicated on the belief that for research on teaching to be most effective, we need to investigate classrooms, evaluate teaching strategies, as well as explore how, what, and why our students are or are not learning. Which leads me to another bill, Professor Bill Guerin, who is actually following the tradition of Professor Michichi as one of the psychology department's award-winning instructors who is himself conducting research, exploring how students learn, what strategies are associated with successful performance on examinations and assignments, what is the role of motivation and anxiety, how does the process of thinking about how one learns ultimately affect subsequent learning. When Professor Gehring approached me with his desire to incorporate his research into my introductory psychology course, I was delighted to collaborate with him to provide a mechanism to help my students learn, by gathering data to evaluate how they learn, to provide information about the successful strategies that students enrolled in my course use to improve their performance. Dr. Gary investigates the variables associated with successful learning by administering study habit surveys that my students complete following each examination. It asks students to assess their study habits, their perception of learning strategies, their motivation to learn, as well as obtaining data on their test performance. He then provides feedback to the students throughout the semester about the patterns that emerge. Therefore, to honor the seminal work on learning and teaching that is the hallmark of one bill, Professor Mikichi, I am delighted to introduce another bill, Professor Guerin, a third now professor similarly dedicated and committed to exploring how students learn best, to describe and discuss learning to learn Lessons for Learning Analytics, my friend and colleague, Dr. Bill Garrett.
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a very much a thrill, and uh, uh, thank you for the very generous introduction, shall we? Uh, it's especially nice to dedicate this particular room because I've been uh, fortunate to educate probably, I think, 4,000 Michigan undergraduates in this room over the past 20 years. Uh, Bill was one of the first people to greet me when I began teaching at Michigan uh, 20 years ago. We had just moved into this building, and there were some faculty offices on the first floor here, and Bill, uh, Keith Smith, and Warren Norman were in those offices, and I was just down the hall because I had just gotten here. They didn't know where to put me, so they put me in this new building. So Bill and I uh, got to know each other a little bit then, and he began uh, trying to convince me to play murder, and I'm embarrassed to say never succeeded, so maybe today will be the first day. <laughs> Um, today I want to talk a little bit about my research, but you know, in preparing for this, uh, I went back and read some of Bill's papers and thought a little bit about higher education today, and I, I realized that there's something very profound about what Bill stands for and that I think is worth talking about today, and so I hope that I can convey a larger point than the work that Shelley and I have been doing. And the take-home message that I'm going to try to bring across is that the the Bill's stance and the ideas and findings that he's had over the years are really still revolutionary. We don't quite appreciate them as much as we could. And really, at this time of transition in higher education, we need them now more than ever. So I'm hoping by the end of this you get a sense for what I'm talking about. I haven't vetted all of these with Bill. I hope, hope I'm at least 80% correct here, but um, we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. So first I want to start out and give you a little bit of what I'm talking about. Now this. Um, some of you are looking puzzled. This is Galileo's uh, dialogue concerning two world systems. And I'm going to be making a point that there are really two different ways of looking at education. And sometimes we swing a little bit too far in one direction. And I think paying more attention to Bill's work might make us swing a little bit in the other direction. So first, a little bit of Bill's perspective. I'm going to bring some quotations from Bill's work to kind of set the stage here. Effective teaching is not just a matter of finding a method that works well and using it consistently. Rather, teaching is an interactive process between the students and the teacher. Good teaching involves building bridges between what is in your head and what is in the students' heads. What works for one student or for one class may not work for others. Uh, this is in an annual review of psychology paper. I still have some sense that the most important focus of instruction is a living, breathing, seeking human being. Thus, the author begs the reader, author being built, to remind himself from time to time that state and trait anxiety, that color plan, inductive and deductive strategies, and our other topics have to do with the feelings and experiences of young people in an institution which may or may not fit well with the rest of their lives. Third one. I think we contributed, this is Bill describing his contributions, in showing the importance of anxiety and self-efficacy as contributing factors in student learning. I think we offered some practical help in the areas of student ratings of instruction and how those can be used constructively rather than destructively. And I think maybe another contribution is the importance of looking at learning through a strategic lens rather than a traditional way, or traditional or what used to be a strictly behaviorist way of seeing. The idea being that students have strategies that they can choose to employ, and part of the trick of being a good student is recognizing what strategies to employ when. Now, part of appreciating, I think, Bill's contribution is realizing that at the time he began his work, he was one of the very few people studying uh, teaching and learning. I think in one of your papers, you mentioned there were like six at one point when he started um, in the world. But the other thing to remember, of course, is uh, Bill's friend. Uh, BF doesn't stand for Bill's friend, but this is BF phone call. <laughs> B.F. Skinner, who's not appearing totally on the screen, uh, well, his head's chopped off, maybe appropriately. Uh, <laughs> at the time, the view of learning was very much that we understand stimuli and we understand responses, and we don't really pay any attention to what's going on inside the head, not only thoughts, but also feelings, motivation, and things like that. And that's uh, Dr. Skinner working with one of his rats. And Bill's contribution, or one of Bill's contributions, was in some ways taking a very sort of common sense alternative view to that. And I decided to call this, 
again, is there any way we can get this thing down a little bit, maybe the top part of the um, There's a way of doing education that actually pays attention to what's going on inside the student's head, what's going on inside the teacher's head, and also realizing that teaching and learning go in both directions. The student is learning, the teacher is learning, the teacher is teaching the student, but the student is also teaching the teacher. And keeping the cycle in mind and also understanding how um, the motivations and influences within a person affect uh, teaching and learning is a key uh, elaboration on the behavior standpoint. Sorry. So in, in looking at that diagram, I realized that there was a... Um, Honestly, I set up the circle before I even noticed that, but it is true that it is sort of shaped like a softball. So I'm going to call it the, the fast pitch softball model of teaching and learning. You played for 56 seasons and the 35 no hitters that you pitched. Is that right? So I'm going to try to elaborate a little bit more about what this means. But uh, keep in mind here that we're paying a lot of attention in Bill's perspective to what's going on inside. And, from, as those quotes suggest, I think, that there's a real human connection between the teacher and student that's really central to the way Bill thinks about things that, of course, behaviors have been noticed, but I'm going to also argue that some of the ways we do things now are also going nice. So there are two distinct models of teaching and learning. We employ both of them here at U of M. One of them is here, the traditional model with uh, Moses, played by Charlton Heston at the front of the room, <laughs> sending commandments out to the students in the crowd, one at a time, just like that. And then we hear from the students at the end of the semester their comments. Best prop at U of M, and worst I've ever had, depending on the particular student's perspective. You'll get both kinds, no matter how good you are. <laughs> So that's, of course, the uh, traditional way of doing things. It's a very, um, it's a model that really doesn't pay attention to what's inside the student. It's more about the transaction between a professor and a student, and observe all this happening without understanding people's feelings. Now, for this next model, this alternative model, I originally had a picture of my dad, because my dad, like Bill's dad, taught in a small town. In fact, my dad was a band director in a town that was so small that the, uh, the uh, high school uh, football players had to take off their uniforms at halftime so they could march in the marching band. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I'm going to put my dad up there and say, well, gee, I wish I had a picture of Bill's dad, but I just didn't. But um, God was looking favorably upon what we were doing here today, and Linda, Bill's daughter, came with a picture of Bill's dad. And in reading this article in my barely... Uh, close-up reading that I have with my context, and I noticed that this article makes the perfect point. So let me see if I can read it here. Uh, your city youth who prides himself on his polish, on his ability to avoid embarrassing mistakes, this is Bert McKeechee, both dead, uh, speaking, of his conformity with conventions, fooling himself. He has merely failed to have the opportunity to express himself. Out here, Bill's dad was teaching in a one-room schoolhouse. Out here, every student in school is a distinct personality. Naturally, they will be prolific, um, prolific sources of original ideas, new thoughts in the future. So, a much more intimate setting in a one-room schoolhouse, this human connection is present. And further on in the article, we understand a little bit about maybe why Bill has his perspective on education. Bill's father speaking again. Youth must be led, comments this man who has devoted his life to the study of just such problems. A teacher may cram knowledge into his pupils by com compulsion, but it doesn't stay there. A good teacher, such as I would like to be, creates ambition in his children, creates a desire for education, arouses a spirit which carries them over the rougher spots on the bewildering road to success. Those are words I think Bill could have written. So this is a model, I think, that's very different from what happens in the lecture hall 1800. And I'm going to suggest that this is the model that under, underlies both teaching tips and learning to learn, the two sort of cornerstone things I'm discussing in this talk. Teaching tips you've already heard of. 
Uh, Learning to Learn is a class that Bill taught here for a number of years to help students succeed as students, um, focusing not on study, not only on study skills, you know, how to remember things and things like that, but sort of at a more deep level, focusing on people's motivation, uh, focusing a lot on test anxiety and how to deal with that, and uh, even on concepts like mindfulness, how to be aware of your own thoughts and respond to them appropriately. Been very influential here. A number of us have taught freshman courses over the past couple of years, modeled on this learning to learn class. And I want to talk about how those two sources are consistent with this idea of Bill. So, teaching tips this is Bill's comment. Teaching tips represents two of the fundamental beliefs I developed in my years of helping graduate students learn how to teach psychology. Almost everyone can become a good teacher if he or she enjoys teaching. And almost everyone will enjoy teaching if he or she can be given some basic skills, tricks of the trade, or alternatives to try when class isn't going well. I think you can take that exact same quote and substitute student for teacher and basically come up with exactly the point that uh, is behind learning to learn. Everyone can be a good student if he or she enjoys learning, and almost everyone will enjoy learning if he or she can be given some basic skills, tricks of the trade, or alternatives to try when class isn't going well. So that's part of the core of the idea here. Now I want to say that the most helpful teaching tip of all, and I'm being totally serious here, this got me through more than one uh, Thursday afternoon, was this one. Some days your lecture will just stick. <laughs> Now, I did find that in the most recent version, so it may have been edited out at some point. But it's a very zen approach. It's going to happen. Just be okay with that. It's very helpful. So every year here, to get to my research part of this, we greet about 6,000 new freshmen, most of them from the towns and cities of Michigan. Many of them are people who look like this. <laughs> this is Bill McKeechee from Holly High School, class of 1938 school song which Bill co-wrote, the red and gray will lead the way to fame and glory, come what may. <laughs> well, my interest in doing research sort of modeled on the stuff that Bill has done came up because in teaching a class like the ones I taught here, Introduction to Cognitive Psychology, I always consistently got this comment from students after the first exam. I studied really hard for the exam and felt like I knew the material, but I did poorly. Now, what would often happen is we talk about what happened during the exam, and it turns out that the things that students were doing that they thought were effective study habits were actually not effective at all. And so I began to do these surveys, model in some degree on the, the motivated strategies for learning questionnaire that Bill developed, to ask students about their study habits and motivation. I would preface the semester with a lecture on how to study and how to learn and some of the things about that. Then after the exam, I would collect surveys, correlate the responses with the exam scores, and then give students feedback about what was working in class. Shelly and I have been doing this for three years now in Psych 111. So what do I tell them? I tell them about learning strategies. I tell them about how important attention is, and in this day and age, multitasking is a big problem. And I tell, tell them about motivation, test anxiety, and self-discipline. So what are some of the things that I find? Well, one of the things that really sort of uh, struck a nerve with me was in that asking students about their study habits and things like that, uh, I thought, well, I'd be able to show that there are certain habits that just you know, are very predictive of exam scores. And there are some, but the things that are really predictive of exam scores are anxiety and worry. This is in a Psych 111 survey showing that uh, the Psych 111 made me anxious and or worried. That's a, that's a questionnaire item. This is exam two multiple choice score. People that strongly agreed that the exam made them worried scored much lower than people that strongly disagreed. The worriers did worse on the exam. This has been known for years. This is another finding that's very consistent with Bill's work. Uh, this is actually an item I adapted from Bill's questionnaire, the MSLQ. I often, and Paul Pinterest, um, which you worked with with Paul Pinterest, I often felt so unmotivated when I studied that I quit before I finished what I had planned to do. This is from my like 240 class. Um, people that were motivated did very well. People that said they were unmotivated did very poorly. I thought this was really interesting. Every time I did these correlations, these would just pop out as the biggest correlates of exam scores. So 
what I do after doing these surveys, I uh, also look at the you know, other behaviors and things like that, and then I give students feedback about what works. So I send them an email um, prior to the next exam about a week um, with wording like this. Because you have exam two in Psych 111 this week, I wanted to pass along a few tips based on the results of the study habit surveys. One important tip is that you can improve your chances of success if you plan your study time. The data from exam one show that those who studied 10 or more hours for the exam in the week prior to the exam scored an average of four points higher than those who studied the six or fewer hours. Another one is uh, active memory strategies. Uh, this one, people who said that they tested their memory by recalling information without looking at the material as they studied for the exam scored eight points higher than those who did not. And then the third example I want to give is, if you notice in this scene from this very classroom, the way teaching looks now, for those of you who haven't seen it, is that everybody's got a Mac. Um, and I can guarantee you that they're not all doing classwork. <laughs> um, this is about laptop use while studying. Using laptops during studying for things other than studying, such as Facebook, etc., people who reported doing that scored an average of three points lower on the exam. And then one final one, people who said that they did check their answers before turning in the exam scored an average of six points higher. So if you find out you're you know, not doing as well on the exam, you get this email, if you read it, Many students don't, but if you read it, um, you'll find that you know you may be able to adapt some, adopt some strategies that will work out. So this is the idea that we're getting a little bit inside the students' heads with these questionnaires. We're asking them these things. Many students say it's helpful. Um, we don't have direct evidence yet because we can't do a controlled trial. We haven't tried one yet. So this is one sort of view of how to use student data to understand students. Um, there's another view, however, which is the view of learning analytics. And this is kind of all the rage now in higher education. Using student data to understand the process of teaching and learning. Sure. sure. Yes. Uh, yes. And now we have, now we're, we're going to take a minute here. Um, do you want me to just finish up? I can just finish up. Or just get ready to go. All right, let's go for it. Sure. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't know what you're saying. And you're teaching fifth chapter. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let the bells them ring, for here they come with banners flying. 
For we their praises tell for the glory and fame they have brought us. Loud let the bells then ring, for here they come, the banners fly, here they come. Hurra, bum, 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 bum. Hail to the victors, valiant, hail to the conquering heroes, hail, hail to Michigan, the leaders and best. Hail to the victors, valiant, hail to the conquering heroes, hail, hail to Michigan, the champions of the West. Hail to the victors valiant, hail to the conquering heroes, hail, hail to Michigan, the leaders and best. With pride we hail to the victors valiant, hail to the conquering heroes, hail, hail to Michigan, the champions of the West. Go! to 
to recall Bill's quotation, is where is the living, breathing, breathing, seeking human being in here, and where are the feelings and experience of young people? So this is a way of doing things that's compatible with this, but I'm going to suggest that we need less of this and more of the, the, the model that uh, we sort of, this is the class that I taught last fall, more of the sort of one room schoolhouse idea, that there's something very special about the human connection between a teacher and a student when they're looking eye to eye that we have to preserve. So I'm going to suggest there are three morals to this story. One is the field of learning analytics has yet to find a way to include the most important focus of instruction in both words, the living, breathing, seeking human being. Uh, the other moral is that classes here are just too darn big. This is about as big as it can be. Um, classes of any bigger than this, of course, are just too much to permit that. And the third moral I'm going to suggest, based on the fact that I just totally enjoyed uh, doing this myself, is that you should read Bill's papers. And I'm dead serious about it. So let me say here, conclude with one wall of text that um, I think is sort of poignantly points out the uh, ideas that Bill stood for here in uh, education. Above all, the new view of human nature is human rather than mechanical, rat-like, or even computer-like. In that respect, psychologists have come back to Jefferson in our four years of 1776. They view human beings as human, capable of rational choice, of responsibility, of participation. Modern psychology is recapturing a sense of the rich functional complexity of human thought and feeling and the value of individual persons who struggle to learn, to love, and to face the great existential problems. As scientists, we are gaining a deeper understanding of the complexity of human nature and reawakening our sense of wonder at its ingenious intricacy. As professionals, we are trying to free people from the bonds of anxiety, loneliness, and injustice and are reaffirming and helping to strengthen a sense of human dignity. As human beings, we are gaining a renewed sense of our own common humanity, a sense that we are not impersonal observers, but co-participants in creating a more humane world for all. It is this purpose that will guide psychology, and I hope all of higher education, for the next hundred years. Thank you, Bill, very much. So thank you so much, Bill. Uh, the fitting follow-up to all of the wonderful work that uh, Bill, uh, Dr. Mikichi, has started. So that concludes our presentation for today. I just wanted to again thank Bill for all of his service to the department, thank his family, to his daughters and his wife, um, for, for coming and supporting um, in uh, Bill's special day. So we do have a small gift, uh, just as a recognition of the day. We have flowers for Bill. We also have a, a, a book bill, a collection of uh, letters and other uh, papers that we've collected over time for you. And when the slideshow concludes, we're going to have a, a reception in the atrium. Uh, but I also want to direct everyone to, as you're exiting the room, to check out the new signage. So we had it covered, um, but as you leave, you'll see that we have the new name outside and also the bronze plaque. So again, after we uh, after the slideshow concludes, you can join us for the reception and for murder. <laughs>